I'm here at the Department of Physics and Astronomy, um, Dartmouth College. We're very excited to have um, Professor Kielhofer here with us to tell us about her work um, on generating and controlling ultra-fast electron pulses for time-resolved electron diffraction. Um, she has a very nice connection to Dartmouth in that um, her PhD supervisor at Stanford, where she got a PhD in 2013, was Mark Kasevich, one of our um, famous alumni. Um, and so it was very exciting to hear her talk about how this work has evolved and how she's been working on it at Williams College, um, where she's been a professor uh, since 2016, actually the same year I joined here. So um, it's nice to see one of my uh, cohort members here to tell us about her work. Um, so with that, Catherine, please take it away. Um, excited to hear about what we can learn about uh, spectroscopy today. Thanks so much, James. And thanks very much for the invitation to come speak. Um, so I'm just gonna give you a heads up that, so I'm an experimentalist, but uh, we, my lab group at Williams is working on building an ultra fast electron diffraction apparatus and we're still working on building it. So I'm not gonna show you any scientific results today, um, but it will give me a chance to tell you a little bit about the instrumentation and, um, uh, and the technology behind what we're doing, um, which I hope you'll find interesting. Um, so as I was saying, uh, my group is building an apparatus for ultra-fast uh, electron diffraction. And what is the motivation for doing that? Well, we want to study ultra-fast processes. So if you think about what happens when a laser pulse, an intense short laser pulse, hits a sample, hits a, hits a solid material, um, the first process that happens is that the laser can excite electrons in the material. And that happens on a very fast time scale. Um, I have later on the slide, I, I guess I should have put this earlier, but in case you're not familiar with femtoseconds, uh, femto is 10 to the minus 15. So this is 10, 10 to the minus 15 seconds. Um, and electron-electron uh, scattering happens on a very fast time scale. And so even though the laser pulse might initially create a highly non-equilibrium um, electron distribution, um, the electrons quickly share their energy with one another. Um, at the same time, the electrons can... Um, Sorry, I just saw something in the chat. Oh, thanks. Uh, apologies, I'm not used to seeing the chat pop up in the middle of the talk. <laughs> um, so, um, so, uh, so, so the electrons at the same time can also scatter off of phonons and so they can transfer energy to the phonon modes. And that happens on a slower time scale, um, more on the time scale of hundreds of femtoseconds. Um, and uh, it turns out that in, that in many materials, there's certain phonon modes that are more strongly coupled to the electrons than others. And so this initial excitation of phonons can actually create a non-equilibrium phonon distribution, um, which gradually thermalizes um, via phonon-phonon scattering. So that's just kind of like a cartoon picture of some of the processes that can happen um, following ultrafast excitation. And we're specifically interested in studying these processes um, in two-dimensional materials, which you probably have heard something about. So the most famous of these is graphene, but in general, there are classes of compounds that in, the, in their bulk form consist of kind of um, stacks of layers that are within the layer, you have um, atoms that are covalently bonded to one another, and um, the layers are held together by van der Waals interactions. And it's possible to pull apart these layers and isolate um, samples that are um, single atoms thick or maybe a few atomic layers thick. Um, and people are very excited about these materials. It's a huge field, so I won't go into all the applications, but um, among other things, people are interested in using them to develop flexible electronics, to have better thermal management for um, electronics and to develop better um, thermoelectrics. So um, how does this all fit together? Well, these processes that we see after ultrafast excitation, the electron um, phonon scattering and phonon phonon scattering, those are the microscopic basis that gives rise to um, your equilibrium properties like electrical conductivity and thermal conductivity. Um, and that might not sound like a very uh, fancy thing to be studying, um, or perhaps it sounds like a really fancy method to study something that's a very common, commonly uh, understood property. But as it turns out, it's extremely challenging to actually model these properties starting from first principles, and especially to model them accurately. And at the same time, it's really challenging to measure them in really small samples, especially when you get to very small samples where the properties of scattering off the surface might, might affect what you actually get um, 
So that's kind of the motivation for going in and looking at this microscopic time resolved view. Uh oh, my slide is frozen. Oh, okay, great. Um, okay, so what's the method that we're gonna use to do this? So um, electron diffraction, uh, if you've taken modern physics, then you've probably been exposed to electron diffraction. Um, at the base, it's a simple technique that can provide information about the crystal structure of a sample. Um, so this is a simplified picture of what such an experiment might look like, but you need a source of electrons. Um, you might need some electron optics to control the transverse properties of the beam. Um, in our case, for example, to get really high resolution in the diffraction image, we might want to focus the the beam onto our detector. Um, and then when you send this, the electrons through a thin sample, most of the electrons go straight through the sample, um, but a small number may be diffracted um, and there are characteristic Bragg spots which tell you something about the structure of the sample. So how does that work? This is the one video in my talk. So if it doesn't, and I think everyone knows what's gonna happen on the video. So um, uh, let me just, um, so in case the video doesn't, in case the video doesn't play, I don't know how to make it play. Ah, okay. Well, the video is not playing, but you all know what's going to happen with the double slit experiment. So um, if you if you bring in um, a, a plane wave um, to a single slit, the single slit will will cause the um, wave to diffract, and you'll have a um, a spreading outgoing wave. And if you do this with two slits, you have two sources that are in phase with one another. And depending on what direction you look from the double slit, you'll see constructive interference in certain directions and destructive interference in other directions. And the specific angles are gonna be a function of the spacing between the two slits. So how this works with electrons is now the electron is our wave. Um, the atoms in a crystalline sample play the role of slits and um, the interference pattern um, that's created results in sharp peaks in particular directions, which are called Bragg spots. So those are the directions where you have constructive interference. Um, and this is a cartoon picture of how that affects, how that relates to the, um, the crystal structure of the sample. So if you change the spacing between the atoms, you're gonna change the directions where you have constructive interference. And so by measuring the positions of those Bragg spots on a screen, you can say something about the structure of the material. So of course, it's more complicated than just like a one-dimensional array of atoms. Um, and so this is a picture of electron diffraction from graphite, which was measured in a transmission electron microscope. Um, and you can see a characteristic pattern of bright spots that corresponds to um, the, the Bragg spots that I was just talking about. And you can see that there's a shadow here in the middle that's blocking the main beam that goes through, which is um, probably most of the beam and uh, it would damage the detector if you, if you didn't block it. So, um, so maybe a few percent of the electrons in the beam have actually been scattered into this diffraction pattern. Um, and uh, so highly oriented pyrolytic, pyrolytic graphite is basically a polycrystalline sample of graphite. But if you think of the C axis, which is the axis that is perpendicular to the layers in graphite, that C axis is aligned for the, for the different crystallites in the sample, but they may be of different orientation. And so in this particular diffraction pattern, you see um, a pattern of bright spots. That's basically one crystallite. And then you see a matching sort of repeated pattern with, an, with a, a less bright spot. And that's diffraction from one that's been rotated by a small angle from, from the original one. Um, okay. Are there any questions thus far? I just realized that um, no one has jumped in as far as I can tell. Okay. No, no questions so far. Okay, thanks James. Um, so uh, going back to the, to the slide that I showed at the start. So I mentioned all of these ultra fast processes um, and uh, for the apparatus that my lab is trying to build, we think that we're gonna have time resolution that will let us get to the kind of hundreds of femtosecond time scale. So these early processes like electron-electron um, thermalization are basically not gonna be processes that we can resolve in our experiment. But um, we do hope that we'll be able to resolve um, ex excitation of specific phonon modes and then phonon-phonon scattering. And so um, I guess I should have said, cause I, I know that there are people of varying levels in the talk and so, in case there are any students who don't know the term phonon. So what phonon refers to um, is 
uh, are the vibrations of the crystal lattice. So if you take like a very, very um, uh, sort of freshman physics picture, I guess, and you imagine the crystal lattice as being a bunch of balls on springs, you can imagine, you can, you can see that you're going to um, support propagating waves in that system. Um, and you can have waves of different polarizations, like you could have longitudinal waves, you could have transverse waves. Um, and those, those waves of different wavelengths and different, um, different polarizations are called the modes. And, um, and the phonon is kind of the quantized excitation of that mode. So uh, the phonon is to the lattice vibration as photons are to light, to, to classical electromagnetic waves. Um, and you can think of this as like the more phonons you have in a mode, the larger the amplitude you've excited that, that particular mode. Um, and so the picture that I showed you before about how electron diffraction can give you information about the crystal structure, um, it seems like it maybe doesn't apply in this case because the kind of physics that we're interested in studying is, um, you know, is looking at phonons, at looking at kind of um, random vibrations of the crystal lattice, which are not coherent. Like the picture that I showed where the atoms all move together, that's a coherent motion of the crystal lattice. But here we're talking about kind of vibrations of the crystal lattice, which might be kind of random um, and incoherent. So how can we actually, um, how can we actually learn about those? So it turns out that the diffraction pattern actually does give you information about that. Um, and so you have to look not at the Bragg spots, but at the, at the space in between the Bragg spots. Um, so this slide is maybe a little more technical than I planned. Um, let, me, uh, let me just show it uh, in terms of kind of a cartoon picture again. So, um, so the condition for constructive interference, which tells you where the Bragg spots are gonna be, is basically that if you consider um, the, this is the K vector of the incoming electron. So this is related to the momentum of the incoming electron. An electron that's scattered has a change in its momentum. Um, which I can give you give you give as delta k, and so you can see that 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 delta k is going to result in the electron flying off and hitting the detector at some angle. Um, so that's essentially what we're measuring in in the um, diffraction experiment is that delta k, and um, the so the condition for constructive interference um, for a particular crystal is that delta k has to be equal to a reciprocal lattice vector for that crystal. Um, and that reciprocal lattice vector depends on the, the real space crystal, crystal structure um, and, and gives you inf some information about the real space crystal structure, crystal structure too. Um, so in addition to this possibility, um, when an electron uh, scatters from the crystal, it can also absorb or generate a phonon in the material. So it can, um, it can get momentum from a lattice vibration or it can create a lattice vibration and lose momentum. And so, um, in fact, electrons can land in lots of different locations in this, uh, or anywhere in this image, um, if they have gained or lost um, momentum from a phonon. And so what's the probability of that happening? So that, that process is called diffuse scattering. Um, and, uh, and the interesting thing about it is that the probability of that happening, so you can ignore, just ignore everything in this equation except this n, which is the number of phonons in a particular mode. Um, at that particular at that particular phonon wave vector. So um, so basically, the probability of having this diffuse scattering is proportional to the population of phonons in the mode. And so the idea there is that if you have a time changing population of phonons in different modes, as you um, as you start in your non equilibrium phonon distribution and then evolve towards equilibrium, um, you should be able to measure those phonons as a function of time by monitoring the diffuse scattering signal. Okay, there's been a lot of exciting, um, fairly recent work here. This is not at all a complete summary, but um, these are two nice papers, one from um, Ralph Ernstorfer's group and another one from uh, Brad Sowick's group at McGill, um, but definitely not a, not a complete bibliography um, of these kinds of experiments. Okay, so that was about phonons. Um, and so far I've just been talking about how the diffraction pattern gives you information about the crystal. Um, but we've talked at the beginning about how we're, we want to see this on fast time scales. And I briefly mentioned that, you know, you had electronic stuff happening on the femtosecond time scale, and this phonon stuff might be happening on the picosecond time scale. These time scales are called ultra fast, um, and they're um, just very far away from your everyday experience. So um, I'd like to tell my students that um, 
five, uh, that, that a picosecond is to one second like five days are to the age of the universe. Um, so it's a, it's a hugely different time scale than the one we're accustomed to. And it's challenging because we don't have detectors that can respond on that time scale. So um, the, the, the sort of issue is, uh, I think, really nicely illustrated by this photograph of um, Usain Bolt running at the London 2012 Olympics. Uh, he's quite hard to see on the picture because he's moving faster than the shutter speed um, of the, that the photographer used. Um, so that's essentially the problem that we have. We want to study ultra-fast processes, but we don't have a camera shutter which is fast enough to see them. Um, and this is a general problem in studying ultra-fast processes. And um, one of the solutions people have come up with is doing what's called a pump probe experiment. So how this works in ultra-fast electron diffraction is um, uh, we basically start with an ultra-fast laser. So that's kind of the core of the experiment is that we have a laser that can produce very short pulses. Um, and we use a part of that laser beam to actually generate an electron pulse. So we shine, um, so this is a beam splitter. So most of the, most of the power goes this way. Um, and a little bit of the power is used to generate an electron pulse. And then the, the, the experiment works by first hitting the sample with a strong laser pulse, which is called the pump pulse. That initiates the, all these processes that I mentioned before. Um, and uh, then at a later time, the electron pulse, which I've shown here in purple, um, I, I, did, um, I did a postdoc in Germany and I, I don't know what color you think electrons are, but I always thought electrons were black and it turned out in Germany they were purple or green. So um, it, it's just a funny fact about nationalities and, and, uh, and uh, electrons. But um, okay, so the probe pulse um, then hits the sample at a later time and um, diffracts from the sample. And so the point here is that um, because we are using pulses, when we measure the diffraction pattern, we're measuring a diffraction pattern that reflects the state of the sample right at a particular time after the pump pulse hit. So the idea is like you hit the sample with the pump, you hit it with the probe, and you get a diffraction pattern. And in fact, your camera and your camera shutter speed can be your camera shutter can be open for a long time because you're basically just detecting electrons, but the electrons, um, the, the time resolution is all set by the length of this electron pulse. Um, and so you can even do this where you leave the camera shutter open and you actually integrate over many cycles of pumping and probing the sample. Um, and so that gives you information about the sample at that one particular time delay. Um, but of course you wanna know other time delays. So you just change the, the, the time between the two pulses. And by changing that delay, um, you can gradually build up kind of an effective movie of how the sample is evolving following the pump pulse. Um, so just to illustrate this idea, because it's a little strange um, if you haven't seen it before. Um, and so imagine you were trying to make a video of dropping a cat. Um, this is, incidentally, I'm gonna show you some pictures. This is not how these pictures were actually made. But, uh, but so the idea with the pump probe experiment, if you were gonna do it with a pump probe method, your pump pulse would be like, what initiates the process? That would be dropping the cat. Um, and then you would take your, your photograph at some later time, delta T1. And so as a, you know, the pump probe method would be, okay, we got our one, we got our one time delay. Now we have to do it again. So we drop the cat again. Then we take a picture at a later time um, and so on and so forth, um, which obviously requires a highly cooperative cat. Um, but, and, and again, uh, I don't think that's how they took these pictures. But um, yeah, okay, so um, this is a good point. Are there, are there any questions about the um, sort of pump probe methodology or this phonon stuff um, at, the, at this time? It's all okay? Okay. Um, so just let me, as you can see, um, the kind of key to these experiments is to have uh, short laser pulses um, because the short laser pulse is kind of the, uh, what generates everything. It's, it's what gives us our time resolution because, um, well, okay, that's not actually true. Uh, I'm gonna mention in, in a moment that the electron pulse ends up being kind of a problem, but at least the laser pulse generates the electron pulse and is also used as the pump pulse. So it's an important part of the experiment. So, um, so now I'm gonna move into what my lab group is actually building. Stuck. Okay, here we go. So, um, okay, so 
my lab group is working on building an ultra-fast electron diffraction experiment, and the kind of core of the experiment is having an ultra-fast laser system. And um, we are currently working on building this system, and we're using um, a method called ch chirped pulse amplification. Um, so uh, we need a certain minimum pulse energy to pump samples. And so this is basically uh, the approach we're taking to build a laser system that will let us do that. Um, and this is a very um, commonly used method to make uh, high energy ultra fast laser pulses. Um, and the ideas behind it are really cool. So I thought I would explain it. I, I don't know exactly what everyone's backgrounds are. So, um, so the start of the whole system is you have what's called a fiber oscillator, which generates an ultra fast laser pulse. Um, and in our case, that, that's about a nanojoule um, and 200 femtosecond pulse. And we're working at a 45 megahertz repetition rate. So there, is, there are 45 million pulses every second. Um, and the difficulty with amplifying these pulses is that uh, the, as, as you get to very, very high intensities, you can get strong nonlinear effects in materials. And um, this whole system that we're building is in optical fiber. So the light is tra traveling in glass. And so we have to be careful not to get to too high of light intensities um, because that can cause the pulse to break up due to nonlinear effects. Um, and so the interesting property of ultrafast pulses is that this is like both good and bad about them, um, is that the shorter the pulse you have, the broader its spectrum. And since materials are dispersive, so um, light of different frequencies travel to different speeds in a material. Um, and in particular, light of different frequencies ha uh, can have different group velocities. So um, as, the, as, a, as, the, as the pulse propagates um, in a fiber, uh, the, the different frequency component, components can actually separate from one another because they're traveling at different speeds. And that will cause the pulse to get longer and it will also cause it to become chirped, um, which you can see actually kind of in this pulse that's shown down here where you have low frequencies at one side of the pulse and high frequencies at the other side of the pulse. So managing this chirp is something that you generally have to do when you work in ultra fast optics, um, but you can use it to your advantage in a chirped pulse amplifier um, because uh, because uh, you can use that effect to actually stretch out the pulse before you amplify it. So the idea is to stretch the pulse um, so that the, intense, the peak intensity goes down, you amplify it, it's still chirped, and then you compress it again and you do the compression um, in free space so you no longer have to worry about these nonlinear effects in, in the glass. Um, and so that's basically the sort of cartoon picture of our system. Um, before we amplify, we will also um, use a pulse picker to reduce the repetition rate of the, of the laser. Um, and incidentally, this idea of chirp pulse amplification uh, won the Nobel Prize in 2018. So, um, so we've gotten a substantial amount of help from Will Reninger's group at the University of Rochester. Um, it turned out that they were actually building a very similar um, fiber CPA system to what we needed. Um, and so they've given us a lot of assistance and shared their design with us. Um, and uh, Will in particular, um, um, well, among other things, was an expert in these um, all normal dispersion fiber lasers. Uh, I guess I, I don't have to go into a huge amount of detail about how the laser works, but uh, it's quite nice. And my student, Josh, this is actually the second laser he's built while working on his senior thesis, but, um, uh, but he actually just finished building this laser uh, about a week ago and has started testing it and Let's see if I can make my um, slides work. So, um, uh, so this is the measured spectrum that he gets and has about a 200 femtosecond transform limit. So if all of the um, frequency components were synchronized, we would have 200 femtosecond pulses. Probably they're not actually synchronized. So we have to test that next. Um, and uh, I think before we started the talk, I was chatting with James that um, as a result of COVID, my students couldn't work in the lab last summer. And so uh, a number of them spent time learning how to simulate uh, laser uh, pulse propagation in fibers. And so once Josh got the spectrum, he went back and simulated the laser cavity to try and understand why he was getting that spectrum. So uh, he doesn't actually have perfect agreement between the two, which I think is why they're not on the same plot, but at least they're sort of similar to one another. 
Um, and uh, my other thesis, one of my other thesis students, um, Declan Daly, has actually been working on um, building frog, which is a technique for actually directly measuring um, how chirped the pulse is, um, which you can't tell but just by looking at the spectrum. And so hopefully we'll soon have frog measurements of, of this laser. Okay, so I'm changing gears and I'm gonna talk about the electron source. Um, so uh, the background to this is that um, there are a couple of different types of electron sources that people use in ultrafast electron diffraction experiments. Um, the earliest experiments used, um, and, and this is still commonly used, um, flat photocathodes. Um, and so this is a really simple uh, gun design. So the, the electron gun um, is where you generate the electrons and accelerate them. And uh, another, another tidbit that I learned in Germany is that the um, in German, the electron gun is literally an electron cannon, which I found also funny because it's like the, sm the smallest projectile I could imagine to, to fire out of a cannon. But um, so, uh, so yeah, so, so this is what the electron, uh, what a flat photocathode electron gun looks like. Um, so the laser pulse in this picture is green, but it's just a laser pulse. So, um, so the idea is that you have a metal surface and you shine a laser pulse on it and just like in freshman physics, you do the photoelectric effect and um, you generate an electron pulse. Um, and then you have an electric field um, applied uh, against that direction because electrons are negative. So you accelerate the electrons um, and you have an anode uh, to generate that field and you have a small hole in the anode and the electrons come out and then you're in business, you have an electron beam. Um, and so, uh, so this was like a sort of very straightforward approach to making an electron gun. Um, and uh, the, my group is actually planning to use a different type of electron gun, which has also gained popularity recently, um, which is uh, a nano emitter source. Um, and these are essentially what conventionally you would call a field emission tip. Um, these are very sharp metal tips um, that can uh, be used as electron sources. And it turns out that they are commonly, well, com they're used in, in high resolution transmission like electron microscopes because they have very nice source properties. Um, and the basic uh, advantage here is that um, the smaller your electron source, the higher quality your electron beam. And so when you work with a flat photocathode source, um, you actually um, have a fairly large source size because you're limited to how small you can focus the laser beam. Um, whereas with a field emission tip, uh, well, you don't have to operate as a field emission tip, you can use it as a laser triggered emitter. Um, you can have uh, an effective source size that's much smaller. Um, and essentially, so these, these, these tips um, are very sharp. So if you zoom in on one in an electron microscope, um, this is actually not an especially sharp tip, but it's one that we made in, our, in my group. So um, this is about an 80 nanometer radius of curvature at the end of the tip. And so um, uh, what does that mean? Well, um, among other things, 80 nanometers is already a lot smaller than one micron, but it's actually even better than that because when the electrons are emitted, um, the field lines are, um, you know, this, this is, I guess, maybe also freshman physics, but the field lines are perpendicular to the surface of the tip. Um, and they are usually quite strong. I'll talk about that just in a moment. The, the field's usually quite strong. So you rapidly accelerate the electrons normal to this hemispherical surface or approximately hemispherical surface. And so it seems like the electrons are coming from a very small spot inside the tip. So you actually have effective source sizes that are smaller than the physical source size of the tip um, and are on the order of a nanometer. Um, okay, so those are the types of sources that we're working with. So I'm just gonna give you a little bit of um, background and how those work. So. Um, so the reason that people originally started using these, these sharp tips um, was actually so they could see field emission. So what's field emission? It's just tunneling of electrons out of the tip material. Um, and so this is a picture of um, the potential energy that an electron sees um, when it's sitting just at the apex of the tip. So this is basically like along the Z direction um, where electrons are uh, along, along the axis of the tip material. Um, and so if you didn't apply an electric field, you would have a work function phi that would uh, be the energy required to remove an electron from this material. Um, and then if you apply an electric field, um, you get this solid black curve. Um, and that's basically like a downward slope because if you have an electric field, uh, let's say a constant electric field, you're gonna have um, a potential energy that's linear in position, right? 
So, um, so that's, that's where you get this kind of linear part. And this curvature is actually due to the image potential. So as the electron is leaving the, the tip, um, you get an image potential and you, get an, you, know, you form an image charge and the, um, that actually effectively lowers the potential energy that the electron feels. Um, and so that results in kind of a lowering of the barrier and there's an effective work function once you apply um, an electric field and that, that effect's called the Schottky effect. Um, so then I guess uh, I'm actually teaching WKB coming up in, in my quantum class. Um, so this is a classic WKB problem, a, cl a classic tunneling problem. But um, as you bend down this barrier, um, the smaller you make that barrier, the more probable it is to tunnel. And there, it's an exponential, um, you know, you have, an, you have an exponent in the exponent, you've got like the integral of the square root of this, uh, the height of this barrier. Um, and so uh, the small, as you make that barrier smaller, you have a dramatic increase in tunneling probability um, with uh, applied electric field. Um, and so this is actually just a really crappy plot showing that kind of effect from a field emitter. Um, so this is just applying a DC voltage to a sharp tip. So the voltage is gonna be proportional to the electric field. So here's field um, and it's basically uh, proportional to the applied voltage and inversely proportional to the radius of curvature of the tip. Um, so, uh, so if you do that, you can get this dramatically increasing current um, over orders of magnitude um, because, because tunneling is so sensitive to the size of this barrier. Um, and then moving back, how do you apply really strong electric fields? You need on the order of gigavolt per meter electric fields in order to see this effect. Um, and to get there, um, if you just look at this equation from introductory electrostatics, um, the field at the surface of a sphere is just equal to the applied voltage over R. Um, and uh, in the case of the tip, it's modified by the sort of geometric fudge factor, which is about five for most of our geometries. So, um, but it's the same idea. You can, you can achieve extremely high field strengths um, at fairly reasonable voltages if you have a very sharp tip. Um, okay, so maybe this isn't the best order, but, um, but uh, we have been making these tips. So um, actually, I think there, there are lots of different recipes for how to make them. And this is our particular recipe. Um, so uh, we have been um, etching them. So I think everyone to make tungsten tips etches, etches using this particular um, chemistry. But uh, the basic idea for making them, so this is sort of a, um, a uh, normal magnification, like not, not under a high power microscope, um, looking at what a tip looks like. It looks kind of pencil-y. We basically start with a tungsten wire um, and we suspend it and we do a chemical reaction which eats away at the wire um, until the wire breaks in the middle. And at that break, you get a very, very sharp point. Um, and if, you're, if you do it in the right way, you can end up with um, these really sharp tips that we need for, for this project. Um, and so um, my students were kind of playing around and uh, it, there, there are lots of historical reasons for why it ended up this way, but we are basically doing this kind of funny geometry where um, we needed to have the tips um, spot welded to the support loop for how we were gonna mount them in the chamber later. Um, and uh, we also wanted to have a very, in reality, it's usually like a very, very short distance between the spot weld and the, um, and the tip. And so they decided to uh, hang it like this and catch the bottom part. So this is actually what it looks like in practice. There's like a clip that's holding the wire. Um, the etching reaction is happening in this, in this um, kind of solution, which is suspended in this gold loop, kind of like a bubble wand with bubble solution on it. Um, and so uh, as, as the solution eats away at the, um, at the wire, we form the tip. And um, when it breaks off, the key is not to destroy the tip after it, as it falls. So that's why they have put these wires in here to catch it. And um, it, it turns out that how sharp the tip ends up depends on how much downward force there is on the, um, on the whole apparatus as, as it's finishing etching. And so uh, we ended up adding these water wings to increase the buoyancy of the bottom part because the, the weight of the hairpin was causing us to have blunter tips. So anyway, that was, that, that's the apparatus that um, uh, it was originally started by Iona Binney who graduated a few years ago and Heather Kurtz um, figured, came up with the water wing idea. 
Um, and this is Iona's design for mounting everything. And this is actually how it looks like in the chamber. There's some extra plates on there. So it looks a little bit different, but this is basically facing this little bright dot there is light catching the tip. And um, we're looking into it from the direction of the electron detector. Um, okay, so tips. Uh, I showed you field emission from the tip, um, but field emission is not how we want to generate electrons because um, we're trying to have an electron pulse. So we're trying to use the laser pulse to generate an, an electron pulse. Um, and uh, there are a variety of physical mechanisms you can use to, um, to generate electron pulses in the system. So um, uh, this is just a reminder of what the sort of DC field emission picture looks like. So this is the Fermi level of the metal. So these are the highest energy electrons, the ones that are most likely to tunnel when you apply a DC bias field. Um, and uh, in this case, you have, um, uh, you now imagine shining light on the material. So you can, you can see that you could set the, so the electric field controls the slope of this um, potential energy curve. So, um, so you could set the slope of this curve so that the barrier is high enough that you don't see DC emission. But when you absorb a photon, now you have electrons that have, um, a, see a substantially smaller barrier and have a much higher probability of being emitted. So that's called photo-assisted field emission. Um, and you, it, since we're working with ultra-fast pulses, um, we can actually do multi-photon absorption. So um, yeah, I, the picture doesn't show this, but you could do like, depending on the height of the barrier and, and um, relative to the photon energy, you might be able to do multi-photon photo-assisted field emission. You can also do um, kind of over the barrier emission. So really this is just the photoelectric effect with the added bonus of having a strong electric field at the tip surface. So, um, so this is like exciting. Um, and usually it would take multiple photons to do this um, to get enough energy to escape classically. Um, and optical field emission is something that happens in very strong laser electric fields, but um, I, I'm not gonna discuss that here because we're not, we're not planning to use that. Um, and so I mentioned, I mentioned the different emission processes because um, it turns out that uh, for our experiment, we would really like to do this photo assisted field emission process because um, the, what I, what I kind of didn't show you is um, backing up. Um, you have strong electric fields kind of at the apex of the tip um, and the tip itself um, has modulations in the work function. So the, the work function of a crystal is gonna depend on the, um, on the surface, on the orientation of the crystal at the surface. So if you imagine kind of just like intersecting a hemisphere with the, with the crystalline material, you're gonna have a lot of different orientations. And so that gives rise to what's called the field emission pattern of the, of the field emitter. Um, and that's just that you, you actually have like a, modu a spatial modulation of the work function over the surface of the tip. Um, and so this, I happen to have this picture in hand, so it's not tungsten, so it's not the actual type of tip that we're using in our experiment, but um, this is a different tip um, made of hafnium carbide. And um, you can see um, that a tunneling process, because it's very sensitive to the size of this barrier, it's sensitive to the work function. Um, and so you get strong, you get sort of um, more spatial localization of the emission because there are only specific directions that have um, lower work function. Um, when you do this multi-photon over the barrier emission, you tend to get emission from more, um, more parts of the tip, um, which is uh, not, not as good um, uh, in terms of um, some of the electron optics design that, that we're doing. So uh, I guess maybe that's getting too technical uh, for this talk, but um, I guess the point to take away is that there, there's some trade-offs between these different emission processes that have to do with the spatial distribution of the emission. Um, and you might also be wondering, like this probably looks like terrible, like not how you imagine the electron beam. Um, when we end up using the beam in the experiment, we're gonna basically um, aperture the beam. So we would basically be only using one of these, one of these bright spots. Um, or actually probably only even a fraction of one of these bright spots. So, um, okay, so changing gears. So that was, we talked about lasers. Um, so how we generate the ultra-fast pulses. We talked about um, electron sources. So how we generate the electron pulses. Um, and uh, I've had, so Heather, I mentioned before, she was working on the tip stuff, but she also um, has worked on sample preparation and Alana's a current thesis student who's, who, who continued Heather's project. Um, and so, uh, so we want to study these um, 2D materials, and 
we didn't have any background with them before, so we had to learn how to do it. So obviously there are tons of groups out there who are preparing 2D materials for various types of experiments. Um, and uh, so this is also, I guess, old hat for all those groups, but we had to learn how to do it. So um, we're using the famous sticky tape method to pull apart the layers of graphite or other materials um, and hopefully make thin flakes. Um, this seems to be a trial and error process. So it takes a lot of patience on the part of the students. Um, and so far, what we're doing is we're, we're, um, we're putting these um, flakes on silicon, silicon wafer. We're identifying thin flakes um, using optical microscopy, which I'll explain in just a moment. Um, and then we need to actually transfer them onto a, onto a sample holder that we can put in the vacuum chamber. Um, and because uh, we're actually, we're, we're working, because we're working with electrons and they actually get absorbed by um, materials, we would like to have our samples basically like freestanding um, in space. So like not supported by anything in the vacuum chamber. Um, so we transfer them to these special TEM supports and you can't see the fun stuff here. Um, th so this is three millimeters in diameter, which is like the standard TEM support um, uh, geometry. Um, and this is actually made out of silicon. And <laughs> this is a really crappy photograph, but you can see there's like a little divot in the middle. The divot is a window in the silicon. And over that window, there's a silicon nitride film, which is 200 nanometers thick, which is too thick for, you know, we, that's, we don't want anything underneath the sample. But then that silicon nitride film has a little hole in it. And we basically want to set the graphite flake that we want to study on top of that hole. Um, and so, uh, so in order to do that, um, we basically have to so we're, we're putting them on the silicon wafer, then we have to take them off the silicon wafer and put it onto the TEM support. Um, and so there's also a great technique out there for doing this. Um, and so we learned how, and, um, and Heather and Alana have been doing it. They, they built a little apparatus for doing it. And this is them posing with all the types of tape they could find in the lab. Um, but I think they're only using that one for the actual exfoliation. So, um, okay. so. This I just thought was really cool. I didn't know about it before. I, I guess if you if you do happen to work with graphene, then you do know about this already. But if you don't, maybe you never heard of it. Um, so uh, it turns out that there's a really nice way that you can detect the thickness of, of um, thin pieces of graphite. Um, and this is really helpful because uh, there, there are good techniques like atomic force microscopy for um, measuring the thickness of graphite flakes, but they're very slow, and so you, because this is sort of a random process of making thin flakes by um, by this, by pulling with sticky tape, um, you uh, would like a rapid method for um, finding thin samples, and um, and so this this method works using um, interference, and the idea is you actually put the graphite flakes onto a silicon wafer, and the silicon wafer always has a native oxide layer, but we actually buy wafers that have a specific thickness of of oxide layer, um, and uh, and so, and we make use of that. So then the thickness is optimized for doing this for doing this imaging. Um, and so what's going on is like if you imagine shining light on this structure um, at each of these dielectric interfaces, you're going to have a reflection, um, and you get interference between the reflected beams. And the interference you can see is going to depend at least in part on the thickness of this graphite sample. Um, and so uh, you can get dramatic variations in the intensity of the light. Um, depending on how thick that graphite sample is. Um, and so this is just a plot of the reflection coefficient um, versus graphite thickness on the y-axis and, um, and, uh, and as a function of wavelength. Um, and so that means if you actually illuminate with white light, uh, you see the graphite show up as different colors depending on how thick it is, which is super cool. So um, yeah, so then I guess I don't have to go into a ton of detail on this. We, it turns out that we don't have um, we don't have a color camera on, our, on the microscope we're using. Um, we're, we're actually borrowing, a, we're, we're using the microscope of one of my colleagues um, who was super nice enough to let us use it. And she has a monochrome camera on it. So um, it turned out that we decided to, to basically look at this with two different filters and use that to try and infer what the, um, what the thickness is. So this is just an example of data with um, uh, two images that have been aligned with this, with the, very complicated graphite flake with lots of different thicknesses on it. Um, and so with all of those different thicknesses, we can simultaneously fit the contrast in these two different images. So this is a histogram of how many pixels there are that show a particular combination of contrast at 480 nanometers and contrast at 561 nanometers. Um, and we could fit that and, um, 
and work out um, how thick the sample is at any particular pixel in this image. Um, okay, so I, th I think I'm probably like out of time now, right? James, I'm supposed to stop sometime, right? You have until the top of the hour. Oh, until the top of the hour. Okay, okay, I can, I can just keep talking about technical things. <laughs> so please, <laughs> please interrupt if you have questions though. Um, so, um, okay, so samples, we talked about, uh, we talked about light pulses, optical pulses, laser pulses to get the, to um, sort of as the core of the experiment. We talked about generating electron pulses, talked about making samples. Um, and these examples are with graphite, but uh, of course we could use these same techniques for other, for other materials. Um, and so I guess the last part, I, I think I promised in my abstract to kind of discuss um, some of the challenges of doing these ultrafast electron diffraction experiments. And so backing up a little bit, um, there, there are lots of different techniques for studying ultrafast processes. And um, uh, they, they all, of course, really benefit from the fact that there's great technology for making ultrafast lasers. Um, and the laser that I was describing to you has like 200 femtoseconds pulse duration, but um, you can buy off the shelf a laser with like five femtoseconds pulse duration. So, um, so we have great technology for that. Um, with electrons, uh, seemingly you, gener you use the laser pulse to generate an electron pulse. So it seems like, oh, okay, I generate a short electron pulse too, no, no problem. Um, but it turns out it's actually very hard to use those electron pulses in experiments without them uh, becoming longer. Um, by various mechanisms. So um, the kind of obvious mechanism that you might immediately think about is Coulomb broadening because, uh, uh, because electrons repel each other. So, um, uh, so that is definitely something people think about and, um, and work on. And uh, I'm, uh, yeah, it's something people will think about. Um, there are actually a lot of experiments where people work in a kind of low numbers of electrons per pulse regime down to um, less than a single electron per pulse, which sounds crazy. But um, if you think about that pump probe experiment as like you pump and then you probe and you have a fixed time delay between pump and probe, you can repeat that over and over again. It's actually okay if you don't have an electron in every single pulse, as long as the uncertainty of when the electron arrived relative to laser pulse is very low, you're, you still have your time resolution. Um, so, um, so you can do UED with single electron pulses, um, and you can do that to avoid this Coulomb broadening issue. Um, but even if you do that, you still actually have a problem, um, and I call it dispersive broadening by analogy with, with light, but um, the basic thing is electrons in the pulse travel at different speeds. So this is really, this is really freshman physics, but um, if you go back to the, the method of generating the electrons, um, whether you're doing it from a flat photocathode with a very weak electric field applied so that I haven't really bent down this barrier at all, or if you're doing it with um, one of these tips where you would have actually, uh, you would have created a triangular barrier, um, you, you're, you always have, um, you know, this material that has a work function and there can be variations in work function with location on the, on the material where you're emitting the electrons. And so, um, no matter how hard you were, and, and of course, there are also, there are also like fundamental energy spreads in, in, um, in field emission too. So, um, so for one physical reason or another, there's always an initial energy spread um, when you generate the electron pulse, i.e. there are different kinetic energies. The electrons are generated with different kinetic energies. Um, so you shine your, your wonderful short laser pulse on your photocathode and you generate a short electron pulse, um, but because you have pulses with different, because you have electrons with different kinetic energies, once you propagate that electron pulse, um, you get the fast ones in front and the slow ones behind and you have a long electron pulse. Um, and uh, okay, if you think a little bit about kinetic energy and speed and, um, and all these things, you'll realize that this is mitigated by accelerating. So if you're going really fast um, the, and you have, um, a, let's say a one EV energy spread between the different electrons in your pulse, um, that's not as bad as if you're like close to, close to zero kinetic energy, if you're traveling at low speeds. Like the difference um, between the fastest and the, and the slowest ones is gonna be um, smaller if you're, at, if you're at high energies. So basically what you wanna do in your electron gun is you wanna accelerate the electrons as fast as you can um, to mitigate this broadening. Um, and 
So uh, a number of years ago, I, I don't have the reference here actually, but um, there's this paper by Ernst Phil um, and, and some other people where they kind of just did like the back of the envelope calculation and said, okay, like if I, if I just look at this sort of um, uh, field emission gun, which is basically like a parallel plate capacitor, I've got a uniform electric field. If I plug in the strongest electric field that I'm comfortable applying in the lab, because uh, I guess if you're, if you're a theorist, you might not know this, but uh, in practice, uh, when, you, when you're when you working with um, with high voltage and electrodes, you generally don't want to exceed, depends on the experimentalist, but you don't want to exceed on the order of six megavolts per meter with macroscopic electrodes. Um, and the reason for that is actually what we just saw with tunneling, which is that it, your electrodes are never perfectly smooth. So, um, so if you actually apply six megavolts per meter in this region between these two electrodes, um, on the surface, you might have regions where you have um, enhanced electric field because the surface isn't, isn't flat. And so you can actually get tunneling and um, create, basically you can generate arcs um, as a result of doing that. It's no good, it's no fun. Um, so, uh, so, so in practice, um, it's, you know, it, you, you can't exceed six megavolts per meter. So if you plug that number in, so maximum accelerating field, um, and you plug in a reasonable choice, a reasonable physically realizable um, energy spread for the pulse, what you find is that um, if you build an electron gun like this, um, you basically end up with 100 femtosecond pulses at the exit of the gun. That's the best you can do. You can start with a five femtosecond laser pulse, but you're gonna have a 100 femtosecond electron pulse at the, at the exit of the gun. Um, so um, so that, that's an issue <laughs> with, with working with electron pulses. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, so, that is slightly mitigated for us. I'm just gonna actually fast forward. Um, that's slightly mitigated for us by the fact that we're working with these field emission tips. So, um, so let me just back up. So, um, so with a field emission tip, uh, we apply very strong electric fields at the surface. So. This is not a macroscopic electrode. It's a nanometric electrode. It's okay for us to have um, for us to have uh, gigavolt per meter electric fields at the surface of this tip. The way that I usually think about it is like the tip is the sharpest thing around. So I can uh, whatever voltages I apply, the strongest electric field I'm going to have anywhere is at the tip, and and so that's not an issue. Um, so. Um, until, I mean, obviously I, I can't apply infinitely strong electric fields to the tip because then I'll, I'll feel them at a ton and melt it or something like that. But, um, but uh, yeah, so, so we can operate these with very high electric field. And so this is just like a snapshot of some simulations. Um, this is highly not complete in any way, but, um, but this just gives you uh, a picture of like a pretty reasonable um, kind of uh, fields in the gun region of um, of the system that we're trying to build. So, um, so this is just basically modeling, um, modeling the electric fields of the gun and, and the trajectories of the electrons. Um, but in this particular model, um, we can apply, so this is like distance from the surface of the tip. Um, and this is uh, the electric field um, in the z direction. So this is just like sort of moving away from the tip um, along the z axis. Um, so, so this, uh, I think we're working with 0.6 gigavolt, gigavolts per meter. So we can actually accelerate the electrons at least for a short distance with much higher um, accelerating fields than you can do in a flat photocathode gun. Um, and that's helpful for mitigating some of these, um, some of these temporal broadening effects. Nevertheless, in our experiment, we basically expect um, that we won't be able to do better than about 200 femtosecond pulse duration at the sample. Um, and that's because um, I mentioned way at the start of the talk that the particular materials we're interested in studying are two-dimensional materials. And so we actually want to work at fairly low um, electron kinetic energy to reduce um, sample damage and also to have very high scattering cross sections for the electrons. Um, and so we're basically designing our system to work from five to 15 keV, which is a kind of unusual energy um, for, for doing electron diffraction. Um, and uh, let me see what other interesting things I can tell you about this. So, so as a result of that, 
um, we're actually working at lower energies than a lot of um, a lot of elect ultra fast electron diffraction experiments. So um, the the kinematic, the, the dispersive broadening because of um, electron of the energy spread of the beam is something of a problem for us, um, even if we accelerate quickly. Um, and you can you can I don't I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but you can kind of do the math. Like if you if you do this at very low energy, so we thought about working at, at um, even lower energies, like one keV or below one keV, but at those energies, the pulse just brought in so fast that it would be really, really hard for us to maintain the time resolution. So this is kind of like our um, happy medium to, to have um, a large enough kinetic energy that we can get somewhat short pulses of the sample. Um, and uh, Kat, go ahead. Catherine, maybe you, you want to pause for questions? Yeah. yeah. The end of the hour? Yeah. I, I don't know if there are any questions. I mean, maybe there aren't. But um, I mean, I'm not sure if there are any questions. Perhaps there aren't any, in which case, uh, you can feel free to continue. Actually, almost there, and Sarah, um, let's see. Sarah, 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 Sarah,
techniques for compressing pulses. Um, so if you if you sort of have look at this picture that we looked at earlier, where the fast electrons end up front and the slow electrons end up in the back, um, if you could somehow reverse that, uh, you could then propagate and you would get a short pulse back again. And you can do that with a time varying field. And so there have been experiments that do that with um, microwave with microwave fields um, in a cavity, um, with terahertz fields, with optical fields. So um, so that's kind of exciting. So this is my um, acknowledgement slide. Thank you so much for coming. Um, and uh, I've had phenomenal thesis students, um, many of whom are in PhD programs. Heather is working at a startup company in California that makes flexible displays. Um, Josh, Alana, and Declan are all going to PhD programs somewhere. They haven't decided yet where that though. Um, uh, we've been, gotten great help from our collaborators at Rochester um, and also phenomenal support from Science Center staff. Um, and uh, my colleague, Kate Jensen, let us use her microscope. Um, and Bob Rawl, let us use plasma cleaner. And these all seem like good ideas to use other people's equipment before the pandemic, but it's been especially nice of them that they've put up with figuring out people moving in and out, out of spaces um, even during the pandemic. So um, yeah, thanks so much for coming. And please, um, if you have questions, I'm happy to answer questions. So, so Catherine, um, one of the things that we do have, um, this is fantastic. Thank you very much for, for coming to visit us and for giving us such a fantastic introduction to the work that you're doing. Um, so afterwards we have typically a coffee break, um, I guess it's virtual now, but in any case we have that, um, which will start, I guess now, so I guess it'll be a, an easier time to have a little more informal discussion yeah. So we can in the recording now and then we can switch over. I'll, I'll put the link inside the chat for everyone. So that way um, we can all just go over there and then we'll have um, a chance to kind of take questions and discuss the slides, perhaps you can even bring over, we can discuss things a bit further. Uh, thank you again very much for coming. Uh, and this has been a fantastic uh, introduction to all this work. Thank you. Thank you.